In 1776, Abigail Adams wrote to her husband, do not put such unlimited power into the hands of husbands. We will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. The Constitution was a practical governing document. That meant compromise, and that meant that who got to vote was left to the states. Generally, that meant that people who got to vote were just a small subset of white men, those who met the different property requirements, with a few exceptions for some women and freed slaves who were landowners, but those exceptions died out. In 1848, the Women's Rights Convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York, which launched the suffrage movement. These women sought equality with men, including the right to vote, drawing their claim from the high principles of the Declaration of Independence. While many of the opponents to this movement were men, a lot of the push against women's suffrage came from other women. Some feared the social change that suffrage would bring to the family. Others worried that women's status as the privileged sex, operating in the non-political spheres of motherhood, education, philanthropy, civil service, and societal reform, would be compromised. Still others thought it would undermine traditional gender roles, which would create an increase in divorce rates and force women into the labor market. They worried that political responsibilities would overburden women who were already very busy. And they worried about an influx of uninformed voters making decisions on important political matters. Most women's suffrage advocates believed in voting rights for everyone or universal suffrage. Yet over time, there were tactical splits within the movement over how to accomplish these goals. In 1869, suffragists Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton founded the National American Woman Suffrage Association to fight for full equal rights for women and a universal suffrage amendment to the Constitution. They opposed the 15th Amendment, which would give voting rights to blacks, but not to women. That split the suffragist movement in two. The American Woman Suffrage Association was created in response to support both passage of the 15th Amendment and an incremental but practical state-by-state -state approach to women's suffrage. The 15th Amendment passed in 1870, and in 1890, the two groups merged. This new generation of suffragists argued that women deserve the vote not because they were the same as men, but because they were different from men. Women argued they could make domesticity into a political virtue, using the franchise to create a purer, more moral, maternal commonwealth. Feminine values would be taken out of the home and placed in public life. Starting in 1910, some states in the West began to extend the vote to women. Idaho, Wyoming, and Utah gave women the right to vote at the end of the 19th century, while southern and eastern states resisted. Nor were the suffragists who brought the 19th Amendment to fruition a monolithic lot. There were blue-stocking Quaker women like Lucretia Mott and Marianne McClintock, who were originally attracted to this women's suffrage through the abolitionist movement. Former slave Sojourner Truth, who gave one of the most rousing speeches in American oratory. Firebrand Alice Paul, who learned her tactics from the most radical suffragettes in England and Henrietta Wells Livermore, the founder of Manhattan's Women's National Republican Club. There were factional splits, big quarrels over big ideas, and detente. Not one of these women was a victim or a shrinking violet. When somebody said these women couldn't do something, they set out to prove them wrong. The Susan B. Anthony Amendment was proposed at a special session of the 66th Congress, convened shortly after the end of World War I. The large Republican majorities in both houses passed this bill after a few hours of debate over whether the federal or state governments ought to determine who had the right to vote. More than 70 years after the women's suffrage movement began their campaigns, the House of Representatives passed the 19th Amendment in May 1919, and the Senate did the same two weeks later, sending the amendment to the states for ratification. On August 18th, 1920, a young state legislator named Harry Byrne broke the tie in the Tennessee House of Representatives after receiving a note from his mother allowing the 19th Amendment to become part of the Constitution at last.
The suffragists of 1919 would be proud to see the progress women have made during the past 100 years. With millions of women involved in local, state, and national politics, women are more politically active as voters, candidates, and advocates than ever before. As history has taught us, you shouldn't forget the ladies. <laughs>